The History of Inauguration Day A president becomes empowered as president, not on election day or even after the electoral votes are counted, but on inauguration day after they are administered the oath of office, Article 2 of the U.S. Constitution. On April the 30th, 1789, George Washington was inaugurated in New York City as our first president. Washington was scheduled to be inaugurated on March 4th. However, weather prevented Congress from being able to make quorum, and thus the beginning of our nation under the original Constitution was delayed almost two months. Interestingly, the text of the original Constitution did not specify a presidential inauguration day, but merely left the matter up to Congress. March the 4th became the traditional inauguration day until 1937, after the passage of the 20th Amendment. On March the 4th, 1801, Thomas Jefferson was the first president inaugurated in Washington, D.C., our new federal capital. After New York, Philadelphia had become our nation's capital, though in order to appease southern slaveholders fearing a northern capital would be inordinately influenced by northern abolitionists, the nation's capital was moved south to its current location. Inauguration was initially held inside the House and Senate chambers of the Federal Congress. However, in 1817, a fight broke out between the Senate and House of Representatives over which specific chairs should be used in the inauguration. James Monroe, the newly elected president, struck a grand bargain and began the tradition of holding the inauguration outside in front of Congress. The outdoor inauguration would prove fatal in 1841. With great hubris, the newly elected president, William Henry Harrison, decided to ride on horseback without a coat to his inauguration, despite the winter weather. Harrison then delivered the longest inauguration speech in American history, a two-hour-long speech which led to the shortest presidency in American history, as Harrison subsequently caught pneumonia and died 31 days later, making John Tyler president. Tyler's presidency created a bit of a constitutional crisis, as the original Constitution never said that the vice president would become president if the sitting president died in office. Many argued that John Tyler was still a vice president who merely held the, uh, the powers of a president. Abraham Lincoln was elected president in November of 1860, but James Buchanan would still be president until Lincoln's inauguration four months later, on March 4, 1861. Knowing that Buchanan would not intervene, Southern states opportunistically began illegally seceding from the Union, thus beginning the Civil War before Lincoln could become president. The vague nature of Article II of the Constitution with regard to when the president actually becomes the president through the inauguration was finally settled in the 20th Amendment, which took effect before Franklin Delano Roosevelt's second term began on January 20, 1937. The 20th Amendment specified that the elected president would become president through inauguration at noon on January 20th, two months instead of four after the presidential election. The 20th Amendment also clarified the presidential succession plan. Inauguration through the years have also had the great fortune to have notable poets speak at inaugurations. Poets such as Robert Frost, The Gift Outright, The Inauguration of John F. Kennedy, Maya Angelou, On the Pulse of Mourning, The Inauguration of Bill Clinton's First Term in 1993, and the youngest to address the inaugural crowd, Amanda Gorman.